If you are here, you have taken an active role in bettering your life, no matter what stage of life you are in. The Banyan Treatment Center's podcast will discuss many topics like recovery, addiction, self-help, mental health, and so much more. It will provide you with tools to succeed, ideas for recovering, and how-tos on creating a better life. My name is Alyssa, and today's episode is about the battle of addiction in the veterans community. Today on our panel, we have Rajani Ayusi. She is an Army veteran and clinician for Banyan who works alongside our veterans. Thank you so much for joining us today. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Hey, Alyssa. Thank you so much for having me. It's always a pleasure to do these kind of podcasts with you or, or inform the community about veteran issues. Um, my name is Rajani. Like you said, I'm a veteran of the U.S. Army. I deployed four times to Afghanistan and a series of events really propelled me into the mental health field, just experiences that I had personally in my life and then, you know, what I saw soldiers suffering with. Well, thank you so much for being here. We're so happy to have you. Thank you. Life after deployment can be difficult to manage, especially for veterans who have suffered through a traumatic experience while serving our country. The risks of addiction and alcoholism, as well as mental illness, increase greatly for veterans due to these negative experiences during their time in the military. Sometimes it's the challenging transition into civilian life that can impact them as well. According to the National Institute on Drug Abuse, more than 1 in 10 veterans have been diagnosed with a substance use disorder. Today, we will discuss the truth about addiction in veterans and how we can help our veteran community. So I know you kind of touched on it briefly in your intro, but how did you get started in helping veterans? Well, I got started after the suicide of my husband. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that point in my life, I had no firsthand experience with mental illness, with substance use. Um, and I was kind of at a loss. And so what I decided to do is channel all of my pain, really just avoiding mm -hmm. my, <laughs> my trauma, right? Um, I tried to channel all of that into helping veterans. And so I became a suicide interventionist and I started doing that within the military. Amazing. Yeah. At that, at that time, I didn't really focus on substance. I didn't understand the correlation really. Yeah. Um, but obviously as I progressed throughout my own healing journey and then, and in schooling and stuff. That's really when I saw the link. Yeah. When it started to make sense. And then you started working at Banyan. So yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Now you have that firsthand experience of absolutely. dealing with the veterans. Yeah. So, um, and I would say in my first internship, probably, in, I think I was in my undergraduate. Um, yes, I worked at an addiction center. Okay. So at a, at a um, county run addiction center down here in Broward County. And that's when I really saw the connection between trauma and substance use. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't, I couldn't deny the fact that most of the clients that were in there for substance use had some level of trauma. Yeah. So what are some of the major causes that veterans become addicted to drugs or alcohol? One of the things that we say often is that the drug or the substance in general is not the problem. It's yeah. their solution to the problem. And I think one of the major causes of substance use outside of the biological aspect, you know, the way that the brain responds to the substance, I think is the fact that a lot of us just lack coping skills. Mm -hmm. We lack the tools necessary in order to process and manage our own emotions. Mm -hmm. And um, substances, they work. Yeah. Right. Like if you're having severe nightmares, you know, I can speak from experience. If I'm having nightmares um, back in the day before I got my own treatment, alcohol worked. It helped to calm me down so that I could sleep through my nightmares. I wouldn't be woken up from them, you know. So yeah. we find solutions that are culturally acceptable in the military. And alcohol happens to be one of those things yeah. that are culturally acceptable. Yeah, that's actually kind of the next question. Like, does the military play a part in possibly encouraging um alcohol abuse or maybe not so much drug abuse, but is it readily available? Um, so this is actually a difficult question because I don't think the military as a whole, as an organization says, yes, guys, I want you to drink and we want you to drink to right. access, right? But I think culturally as, you know, when you get down to the, the team level or, you know, maybe a little bit above that, the, pl the platoon level we use alcohol for everything. We celebrate with alcohol. We process yeah. with alcohol. We get sad with alcohol. We're angry with alcohol. We're tired. We use alcohol. So it's culturally accepted. Um, I think much like you would see in in someone who's going to college and like that party yes. lifestyle where alcohol is the cultural norm, it's like that in the military as well. I know one of the uh, the common debates is constantly like, oh, you can 
put your life on the line and serve for your country at 18, but you can't drink alcohol. Yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I don't condone breaking the law, but I, I, I'd be lying if I said that. Yeah, soldiers are drinking mm-hmm. before the age of 21. There's there's repercussions for it if you get caught. Yeah. Um, especially if you get something like a DUI. Uh, but yeah, it's it's hard to tell a soldier that survives war that you're not allowed to celebrate with a drink. I, I mean, yes, I understand the law and I yeah. condone <laughs> following the law. I, I get all of that stuff, but it is a different world in mm-hmm. the military. It really is. It's a completely different culture. So what was your personal experience coming back to civilian lifestyle? Because I know a lot of veterans struggle with that. It's difficult. I mm-hmm. mean, there's there's a good and the bad of it. I would say that you come back with a new sense of appreciation um, for what you have because when you're when you're in Afghanistan, that's where I was. Yeah. But when you're overseas, um, you miss home, mm-hmm. right? And you're like, oh my god, I just want to get back to the states. I want to get back to the AC. You know, I want to get back to the conveniences, Starbucks. You yeah. know. But then you come home and you feel so displaced, so uh, so disconnected from family, so disconnected from friends. And so in my experience, I was like, I got to get back to Afghanistan. Um, I think the transition is hard because your brain is still on some level seeking after the adrenaline that you experienced. Mm-hmm. And so when you get back and life is back to normal um, or status quo, sometimes it's a little boring. Yeah. And you don't know how to reconcile that on the inside because you're like, I love my spouse. I love my family. I want to be there for him, for them, but I don't know how. And also, I especially if you still have people that you deployed with still downrange, mm-hmm. there's this uh, kind of obligation that you feel to be there for them and to help complete the mission, you know, um, never leaving a mission uncompleted. You, you don't quit. And so sometimes you have that guilt, like, oh, I went home and they're still there. And, you know, I quit, even though obviously you didn't, you got orders to go home. Yeah, absolutely. I guess that kind of, that does make sense to me though, because you're out there, you have your life on the line every day. There's so many unique challenges coming at you. Mm -hmm. There's probably a lot of highs and lows. Mm -hmm. And with that, you're saying like the adrenaline to then come home to everything just being so calm yeah or it's a different kind of stress Mm -hmm. right so like I didn't I didn't have children coming home but I heard from a lot of you know the guys that I deployed with they come home and the kids are whining and they need things and it's hard to connect to that because you're like no one is dying right what is the problem you know like the continuous tantrums that you would get from a toddler that most people are like oh they're just they're being two you know like that's the way that it is um the noise is really hard to process mm-hmm. because it's frustrating and you don't have a real outlet. Um, you don't have a real sense, I think, of empathy. Yeah. Right? Like how do you, you, you – you're taught so well how to compartmentalize, right? Like when you're downrange, that is your mission. You're not supposed to focus on things that are going on back home. You're supposed to stay focused on the mission at hand. Yeah. And so – you focus on that so much and you try to ignore what's happening at home, but everything that's at home is still there when you get back. But now you don't know how to deal with that because yeah. you can't compartmentalize your kids, yeah, you know, or your spouse that misses you because you've been gone for six months and they want to spend time with you and you don't really feel like it. Mm-hmm. You know, that's a hard thing in a relationship where you're like, you know, I do love you, but I really just want to get back out there. You know, like I really just... I'm, I don't want to sit on the couch and watch TV. I'm bored. Yeah. Does the military offer anything to help with that transition? What does that look like? Uh, yes. I think the military has the resources available, mm-hmm. but the culture of the military does not support really a soldier using the resources. Yeah. Right. So it's not like we don't have an extensive behavioral health uh, department and we we have chaplains and we have surveys and we have trainings we have all of these things available to us while on active duty I think the problem is is that our culture doesn't support that we suck it up and we move on and we want to be strong and we want to be good leaders and in the military a good leader looks a very particular kind of way yeah right so right place right time right uniform and if you're doing all of those things then there really shouldn't be anything else going on. There shouldn't be anything else that's bothering you. Um, at least that's how I felt. And I know that a lot of, you know, like when I talk to my friends that have since gotten out, 
um, they share very similar sentiments. It's not that the resources aren't there, mm -hmm. but do you want to be that guy that yeah. has to use them? Or do you want to be that girl that has to use them? Wow. So addiction treatment is available for active duty members then? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So, absolutely. Like what would that look like? I mean, if somebody was deployed, for example, and they felt like they were having an issue and they needed support. Well, if somebody, you're not supposed to be consuming any substances okay. on, on <laughs> I mean that that is a punishable uh, a punishable offense, but if it was discovered that you were um, drinking, yeah, downrange, and it was a problem, you know, like I've heard stories of of soldiers that had alcohol, um, an alcohol addiction, drinking hand sanitizer, you know, wow. like yeah. so if it if it gets to that or ordering listerine and drinking listerine while deployed just to get the buzz, um, you'll be sent home. Yeah. And then you will be evaluated by behavioral health and then you'll probably have to complete a program. Now, whether or not you are in a residential treatment center, because um, the military does have residential treatment or outpatient would be at the determination of medical. Right. Like, do you need a detox? Are you detoxing from alcohol? Are you detoxing from benzos? You know, like that, those kinds of things. Um, if you it seems like, or if the soldier expresses that they're just not going to be able to quit, they're not going to be able to recover, um, you, you most likely you'd be discharged from the military because at that point, you know, I, this might sound uh, insensitive, but you're a liability. Right. Right. In the military, soldiers have a very uh, specific job and it's national defense. It's an important and it, job. Absolutely. And it's not just soldiers, but, um, Airmen, seamen, Coast Guard, you know, so we all have, we sign up for the military, we all have these very clearly defined responsibilities. And at the end of the day, the foundation of those responsibilities is national defense. So if yeah. you have somebody in your ranks or in, in um, your unit that is compromising that, but that they're not in the military and their symptoms are being exacerbated by the stress of the job, mm -hmm. right? So I think in the best interest of the military and in the best interest of the individual, um, oftentimes you have to part ways. Yeah. But I, I have seen uh, scenarios where the military does provide services. And usually before uh, an individual is discharged, they are given access to those services. Well, that's really good to hear. Yeah. You know, I think uh, the biggest thing then to to overcome is getting people to feel comfortable with using the resources and destigmatize that. Absolutely. And I think probably in recent years, things have changed mm -hmm. a little bit. I think it's kind of hard to ignore the 22 veterans a day that are dying. Yeah. Um, and that definitely plays a role into how active duty service members kind of see mental health and what's going on and what can I do. Uh, but you do have people and oftentimes it's people in leadership that are still stuck in that old military mindset mm -hmm. that says that you just, you know, you get it together, you adjust fire, you drive on, and all of those things are true. But for the person that can't do that, right, I feel like there has to be a safe space for them to be honest and be vulnerable. And, you know, then the military proceed with, honestly, what's in the best interest of the military preserving the soldier at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it makes a lot of sense. You know, a lot of the trainings about being tough and getting through it, but not necessarily process processing things, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. like when you're in basic training, I mean, they're building you up to be tough. Yeah, for sure. You it's know? necessary. Mm -hmm. Right. This, <laughs> we're, we're not like blowing bubbles, you know, for fun. You know, yeah. it's, this is not our job. <laughs> like, hey, go out there and make people smile. That's. Yeah. I think that uh, ideally that would be nice if we lived in a world where that was our big responsibility is mm -hmm. to go into these foreign countries or go on foreign territory and make people happy. That's not the reality of right. of what we do in the military. Um, it's most of the time quite the opposite. And um, you have to be a certain kind of person. Mm -hmm. You know, like I don't want to take away from that. If you are thinking about being in the military and you've signed up to do this job, you have to, there has to be a certain part of you that is tough and that can endure and that is resilient, right? Right? Because you're, there's a good chance that you're going to experience some things. And I'm not even saying like war trauma, right? I'm saying the sacrifice. 
of having to show up when you don't want to show up and be on time when you don't want to be on time and respect authority when you don't feel like it, you know? Yeah it takes a certain individual that is disciplined or at least willing to exercise and become disciplined. Um, and not everybody's cut out, right. right? I think that sometimes people join the military and they have an idea of what it was, what it's going to be like, or they say, you know, like I'm going to join for college, which is okay, fine. But in the meantime, you have to do the job and right. they, they just can't. Yeah. Um, and so for those individuals, you know, they're, it's possible that they're best suited in, in a different career. Right. Right. Um, but for the soldier that is burnt out, for the soldier that is going through something, there are resources available that are that are not going to cost you your job, mm-hmm. right? So take the resources before it becomes a situation where you're overwhelmed and you just can't manage anymore. You know, and I think that that's probably one of the things that we have to work on is that we, in the military, we see behavioral health and all of the assistance that's, that is offered to us as a last resort. Right. And so then, you know, it's like a knee jerk reaction. I can't handle it anymore. You know, my marriage is falling apart um, in crisis. And so now I'm going to ask for help. Right. But we can be proactive. Right. And work on those things before they become overwhelming. You know, like I have one nightmare. I don't know what's going on. I'm just going to check in. Right. Like I'm going to see what this behavioral health thing is all about. Um, Or I notice that I'm drinking to excess and I'm waking up for formation every morning and I'm hungover. Right. Or I'm craving alcohol in the at breakfast time yeah. right why aren't we encouraged at that point to get help you know why isn't it discussed hey if you feel like you need alcohol in order to have a normal day or you feel like you need alcohol in order to sleep that's probably the best time to to get help right not when you're not showing up anymore or when you're getting a DUI etc so what has it been like working with the veterans at Banyan as they're recovering from their alcohol and drug abuse? Uh, It's been incredible Mm -hmm. for so many reasons, right? Because I got into this field because I wanted to work with veterans who were struggling with (laughs) mental illness and and substance abuse. So on a very uh, selfish level, it's rewarding. But I think the best thing is to see the hope that they can have a really great life outside of the military Um, And that is for the veterans that come in with an honorable discharge and the veterans that come in with a dishonorable discharge. I think that sometimes we look at the veterans that have a dishonorable discharge and we kind of cast them out. Yeah. And uh, something that I've worked really hard to build in our veteran treatment community is that no matter what, the veteran came in to serve. Right. They signed their name on the dotted line. Very few people are willing to do that. And they did that. And for whatever reason, you what I've seen here is a lot of times it's dishonorably discharged because of substance use yeah. and an unwillingness to see treatment. But you know, you know, like if you're not ready to get help, the nature of addiction says that you're just not going to get it. Right. Like it's not a matter of will um, or, or uh, reason. It just is what it is. Right. And so respecting the, uh, the struggle of addiction and the struggle of addiction with veterans who oftentimes are trying so hard to avoid the trauma that they experienced. Well, I think the patients are very lucky to have you and that you share your personal experience with them. And I know they all, you know, rave about you and your groups and how they can relate. And they, you know, they have someone that truly sees them, you know, that's what we try to do here. I mean, we just recently announced that we got psych armor certified at all of our Banyan locations. Our staff are trained and equipped to understand what they're going through and help them process it. Yeah, yeah, no, that that's incredible because I took the psych armor training just, you know, obviously I'm a veteran, so I came with a different perspective um, and I really appreciated what I was seeing in the psych armor training and I was like, man, they, like this training really got it. You yeah. know, like it did a really great job of kind of bringing um, – this character of a veteran to life, you know, like the fact that it's not just a caricature, it, it is a real person that's multifaceted. Yeah. And there's a lot of different traumas that are involved in either substance use or mental health. And we look at it like, oh my gosh, they're traumatized for more, right? And oftentimes that's not the case. Right. And so I really appreciate that. And I, I would say like, as far as uh, Banyan is concerned, I think what makes Banyan great is the staff's willingness to learn, Mm -hmm. right? I get so many questions about veterans and I'm by no means an expert on all veteran experiences, right? But 
having that conversation or your willingness to have the conversation like, hey, you know, I've been a therapist for 20 years, but I don't have experience with veterans. Can I pick your brain? That to me shows um, really the heart of of Banyan and the work that they want to do in the veteran community. And, you know, I appreciate it as a veteran, but I know that the clients as well, um, because oftentimes they tell me, you know, oh, well, they have no idea what's going on, but at least they ask. Yeah. Right. And I think that shows a lot of respect, which is a huge thing in the military. Yeah, absolutely. So what do you think the public can do to help veterans, help support veterans? Do you know of anything? Do you have any suggestions? I think the main thing that the public can do is get educated, Mm -hmm. right? Because sometimes veterans um, and people, all people, right? You get so caught up in what's happening in your life, whether it's your addiction or your mental illness, you know, that that pathology, it kind of takes over. And so sometimes you can't see Pass the nose on your face, right? And yeah. so to be able to have someone that says to you, hey, it looks like you're struggling, here's a resource, right? And you're not going to know the resources if you don't do some research. Right. So being aware, if there's a veteran in your life and you're suspicious, you know, or you're concerned, do some research yeah. and find where the local VA is or where their local um, uh, outpatient clinic is or, you know, is there a treatment center around? Find some resources so that the all of the pressure to get help doesn't fall on the veteran. Right. I've kind of done some of the legwork. Are you interested in any of these? You know, I found this really great therapist that takes your insurance. How about we go together? You know, those kinds of things. I think um, one thing that we lose when we get out of the military is camaraderie. Yeah. And it's hard, you know, like it's hard to, to trust people that you don't know or that haven't gone through what you've gone through, but showing that you've made an effort to understand I think that goes a long way. Yeah. And then don't judge. I love that. I love that. It's almost like, you know, they're there with their troop, but it's like, okay, now let's let's try to be their troop at home. Mm-hmm. You know, let's support Absolutely. them. Show them love. Show them that you're there for them to help them transition through this experience and mm-hmm. don't let them feel alone because it can happen so easily. Absolutely. And the only difference between, you know, you and somebody who's struggling is a different, you know, a, largely in part, it's a difference in choices. Yeah. Right? And you made a choice to do something different with your life, and they made a choice to do something different with their life. They couldn't control what their brain did yeah. once those choices were made. Right? So, like, maybe you've drink, you know, had a drink of alcohol, and you're like, well, I can stop whenever I want. Well, that's really great. Your biology is different. But for somebody who can't, they can't control that. Mm-hmm. Right. They couldn't control the fact that they became an alcoholic. It, it uh, kind of baffles my mind when people are like, well, just stop. Well, if it were that easy, wouldn't they just stop? <laughs> you know, like yeah, we wouldn't have 20 million people in America struggling with yeah, addiction and alcoholism. Yeah, Let's know, wake like, up, people. The, the dismissive nature, <laughs> yes. you know, and it, 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 you see it in media. You see it, you know, like um the, the alcoholic and the drug addict is always portrayed in, like, really this destitute life, you know? Um, and the truth is, a lot of them are struggling and they're running your companies and they're struggling yeah. and they're, they appear to be really upstanding citizens who are slowly dying on the inside yeah. because they don't want to disappoint their family, their friends, society, and admit, like, I can't control this drug. This drug has a control over me. And so I think being uh, compassionate and empathetic to that, even Mm -hmm. when we're casually speaking, because you don't know, you know, like you're making fun of an addict and you may be sitting next to one and now you're one less resource that they have, you know? So I I think paying attention to that, um, destigmatizing mental illness for the military and destigmatizing substance use in the military starts with destigmatizing it in the civilian world too. You know, like it's the way that we address these issues when we think that there aren't addicts around. Yeah. I think that's really important. Yeah. I mean, what you said earlier, you know, about addiction and alcoholism being a symptom of the problem, we talk about that a lot because it's true. You know, if you can't get to the root cause of what the issue is, the substance use is going to continue. Absolutely. And I think a lot of people have a hard time, like, associating the two together. Mm -hmm. People don't just wake up and say, I think I'm going to become an alcoholic today. Like (laughs) It just doesn't work like that. It's a series of events, a recipe for disaster. Mm -hmm. It's like the perfect storm. Exactly. We talk about that all the time. I mean, we can look at that, like, 
you know, you look at somebody's marriage and you're like, oh my God, that marriage fell apart. It was the perfect storm, yeah. you know, like multiple deployments and she was lonely and blah, 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 blah. Like you have all of these things and it makes sense. But then when you have somebody who is struggling, it stops making, it stops making so much sense, right? And you're like, this is a brain thing. This is science. We yeah. are not, you know, mystifying addiction, you know, like this is not some faith, spiritual, weird thing that's happening. It's scientifically proven that the brain changes for somebody who is struggling with an addiction. So we don't stigmatize cancer. We shouldn't stigmatize addiction. Yep. Because treatment is treatment. No matter no matter what illness it is that you're facing. And I think that we have to be more supportive of people. Um and of course, you don't you don't enable, you don't coddle, right? Like there has to be hard lines and boundaries. Right. Um because you don't want to love someone to death. But saying, "Hey, I see what you're see what you're going through. I may not understand it, but I'm willing to help you. Right. I think that goes a long way. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I just, I read something online earlier this week that said, if somebody is struggling with understanding addiction, just try not touching your phone for like an hour. Oh my gosh. Yes. (laughs) Just try not looking at it. Try not lifting it, checking the time. Just try not touching it for one hour and see how many times you go to touch it. And Absolutely. that's like very similar to the thought process because we are addicted to these things now. You know, Absolutely. it doesn't have severe consequences like drug and alcohol mm-hmm. abuse, but it's the same thing. It's the same thing. I had to do a project in my undergraduate. You just reminded me where we had to abstain from something and I chose sugar. Why? <laughs> it was horrific. Right. But um, I was like, I'm going to do this 30 days. I had to keep a log every day, right? In a journal, you know, um, and I realized that I went through the same process that a lot of my clients go through. You know, I would start to rationalize, like, well, I haven't had sugar in five days, Regina. You really deserve this cheesecake. You know, like, you've done such a good job. It's not that big of a deal, just one slice of cheesecake, right? And then the next day, I wake up and I'm like, ooh, you know, like, now I want a donut, you know? And obviously the consequences aren't that bad, but that's really what happens. That's what happens with a lot of people who are trying to fight this disease. It's you go through so many emotions. You're angry, you're frustrated, you're irritated. I just was abstaining from sugar. And I went through all of these emotions. And, you know, looking back now, obviously I'm I'm eating sugar again. Um, (laughs) But looking back at that, it really put into perspective, right, what happens to an individual on an exponentially uh, larger level or yeah. a larger scale when they're trying to abstain from something like heroin or alcohol. Yeah, that your it's, body's physically dependent to. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, and then you're like, oh, I can't believe this person is so mean to me. You know, if I <laughs> if I got a quarter for every time a client cursed me out that was in detox, you know, I'd <laughs> have a little bit more money. Um, the person is not feeling well, you know? Yeah. You're not feeling well. It's like having the flu and then getting hit by a truck at the same time. It's just not a good experience. And so there's so many layers to this thing. Um, And if, you know, you're dealing with somebody who's struggling with addiction, I think it's really, really important to identify. In the military, we say it's above our pay grade. You know, like when we identify a problem that our rank can't handle, it's like that's above our pay grade. Sometimes I think families, um, to to the detriment of the individual struggling, they really try to handle something that's just way above their pay grade. Yeah. Way above their level of expertise. And there's no shame in saying, I can't handle this. Yeah. You know, like I love you, but this is just not, I just don't know what to do from here, you know? Um, your home is not a treatment center. No, 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 no. Let's, no. Um, let's trust some professionals. <laughs> <laughs> no, your home is not a treatment center. You know, your church is not a treatment center. I'm all about faith, but these are things that have to be tackled on yeah. a, at, you know, largely in part on a medical level, right? And Banyan has a faith and recovery program, so we can do both at the same time. But this is not a matter of will. We it's not a battle of a person's will. This is something that has to be tackled. Um, you know, we're we're coming at it from multiple angles at the same time, right? In a very controlled and safe environment. And I think that that's really important. Yeah. Well, this has all been amazing and I really appreciate you coming out here today and speaking Thank with you. us. So do you remember where you were? on September 11th and how that event made you feel. 
Absolutely. I even remember what I was wearing. It's <laughs> so bizarre. I was sitting in a chorus class um, in 10th grade at Dr. Michael Crop High School. And I was wearing a blue sweater and it said Gap on it. <laughs> <laughs> and I couldn't, I couldn't believe what was happening, you know, and we trans, I was in another class before that, you know, like I heard like the rumors, like the Twin Towers just got hit by an airplane. Um, but by the top, by the time I got back to my chorus class, um, I think I was kind of in a state of shock. Yeah. Also feeling a little bit far removed because I didn't know anything about terrorism, you know, yeah. like I didn't understand any, anything like that at the time. It's so foreign to a 10th grader, I would imagine. Yeah, it was, <laughs> it was super foreign, but I did have a girl in my class whose father was working. Um, I can't remember if he was working in the Twin Towers or if he was working in the area. And so she got up and she ran out of class. Where were you living? I was in Aventura. Oh, okay. I went to Michael Crop. It's like in... Not Aventura. It's called Unincorporated Dade County. <laughs> well, I was just curious because you said, you know, her father was working in the Twin Tower, so I didn't know if you were up north. No, 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 no. Okay. I'm from I'm from Miami, born and bred. But, um, yeah, her dad, I guess, was traveling for business, and she was in my chorus class. And I felt, I felt like something was changing. I just couldn't put my finger on it. I yeah. was like, oh, man, this is crazy. My grandfather at the time, he worked for a bank in Manhattan, and he had to – to walk across the bridge um and you know so like once those stories started coming in you know I have a lot of family in New York and Long Island and in Queens um but once the stories started coming in it it's like whoa what is happening yeah I said but the most incredible part about that was the way that the country changed afterwards yes I, that's what I remember the most like the community and the unity and to see the American flag, you know, proudly being flown all over the place. I mean, you can't, you can't, I couldn't really put into words, you know, the love for my country that was born out of that experience. Yeah. And then obviously, you know, you go to the military and it just gets, it gets better from there. But um, yeah, that was wild. Yeah. That was a wild time. It really was learning how people can so severely hate. I think that was that was a big thing for me. Like, why do they care about us? Right. <laughs> you know, like, that's what was happening in my mind. Like, why do they care about us? We didn't do anything, you know. That's war. That is, yeah. And war on terrorism. That is it's war. Like, you don't know who's the enemy. Mm -hmm. But I remember when I enlisted, I remembered September 11th, you know. So what do you think 9-11 had an impact on the veterans community. Like, how do you think it impacted the veterans community? So I've met a few veterans that got out of the military before 9-11. Okay. And most of them wanted to go back. Yeah. Um, I have met a few that were like, man, I dodged a bullet, you know. Uh, and like I said in the beginning, not everybody's cut out for the military, so I get it. No shame in that. But most of them wanted to go back, especially the ones that had people that were still actively engaged in the fight um and then for all of the veterans who joined after 9 11 you know like i joined with an understanding that i was going to war yeah and i was going to war because i believed in fighting for my country i believed yeah. that in some way what i did in the military greater you know greater small was going to help to prevent another 9 11 yeah and so that was that was kind of a motivator for me. You know, that was a driving force in really my excitement mm -hmm. to go to the military. And to then, be a part of that. Yeah, to be a part of something bigger. And I didn't, you know, you don't know. Like, you're naive when you enlist and you're like, I'm going to kill bad guys. And I'm going to do all of this, you know, yeah. crazy stuff. And some, yeah, some of the stuff I did was crazy but um, and exciting. But you you have this picture of like what this group of bad people did to us, yeah. And I'm I'm gonna avenge that, you know. Like I'm gonna I'm gonna do something about it. And I think that you know, a person with purpose, that's a dangerous individual, yeah. Right? When you believe in what you're doing, and I'm not saying dangerous in a in a bad way, but like that's a powerful person that yeah. that is working towards something that they truly believe in. Um, I truly believed in the work that I did in the military. And of course you learn things here and there and after the fact and from experience. And, you know, it's not, 
all fun and games, but um, I believe in service to my country. Yeah. And so that was important for me to be able to exercise that in some way while I was while I was in the military. So what would you suggest to somebody looking to get help? If you're in the military and you are looking to get help, I would say ask for it. And if you feel like you can't go to your command um, or your first line supervisor, you can go right into behavioral health. You go right to your, your primary care provider and tell them that you have a problem um, and allow them to port, um, point you in the right direction. If you're not in the military anymore and you have served, there are so many resources available to you. Obviously, Banyan is one of them. Um, and we work closely with our veteran organizations and, and the VA. So walk into the VA and let them know what's going on. And again, allow them to point you in the right direction. I think a lot of the difficulty in getting help for a lot of people is the lack of vulnerability. Yeah. You know, like you have to be vulnerable. You're going to have to like kind of throw your hands up and say, I can't do this anymore. I need somebody else to step in and point me in the right direction. And then if you're not in the military, um, pick up the phone. <laughs> <laughs> Call us. Because <laughs> your process is a little bit different. But regardless of what phase of life you're in or what, you know, what you're doing in your life right now, there there are so many resources available to you, either for mental health or, or for substance use. Well, thank you so much, Rosani, for joining us today. Thank you, Alyssa. It's been great. I love this. Always a pleasure to have you. (laughs) Well, we hope you enjoyed today's episode. Remember that growth and recovery are possible and it can all start today. Be sure to follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Banyan Treatment Centers and make sure you're subscribing for notifications of new episodes. And please don't forget to leave us a review. If you or someone you know are struggling, call us today at 888-515-7706. Thanks for joining us today on the Banyan Podcast.